I really, it's, it's a great honor to be here. It's a great honor to, uh, to be part of the, the, the series here. And I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna no, no, I got too many. That's why I won't get nervous. I'm going to show you So this is, many of you have been to some of these talks, this uh, sustainability series. We had uh, John Andrews, who uh, was with the American Indian Health uh, Healing Center. We were talking about health and sustainability. We had uh, Alexa Delwish, who was with the Food Policy Council, just talking about food and how can you create a community, a city, reimagine a city through food. We had Becky from Sociology talking about uh, unincorporated cities and how, how there's a relationship between that and environmental racism and kind of economic and environmental injustice. We've had uh, Kathy uh, Barlow in, in uh, Kinesiology talking about obesity, fighting obesity in schools. And also we've had uh, Renee from the Food and Water Watch, correct? Talking about all those issues and sustainability and how it's related to food and water and transportation. And so you may ask yourself, why is a colonial, how the heck is a colonial historian, uh, why am I up here talking? Uh, and how do I fit in this, in this sustainability series. We also have, by the way, Manuel Pastor, who's going to be speaking next week, correct, on Wednesday night, yep. talking about sustainability and regionalism. How can, you, how can you stitch together not just a city, but a region through equitable, uh, sustainable policies? Hey, Pastor, just to put a plug in for that, she'll be a really, he's doing really, really interesting work. He's in USC, um, and is long-standing, he's been working in environmental justice for years and years and years. Found it. I mean, he's just—he's great. He's huge. He's big. He's gonna be talking about regional equity, um, and it's, it's really cool stuff. Really, really cool stuff. Now, this stuff today is also cool, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean he—he's also started the uh, Center for Tolerance in uh, just, I forgot the Center for Tolerance at UC Santa Cruz. So he's the Santa Cruz slug. Slug, you can't grow on <laughs> Santa Cruz slug, right? So. How does, a how does a historian fit in this conversation? Well, this is a question that many we historians always ask ourselves. How do we tell stories, and how do we make it relevant to our students? How do we make it relevant to other academics? That's one of our primary audiences. But how do we make it relevant to the public and to policymakers? How do all these folks that, we've, that I just mentioned, how can they be enriched? How can they tackle these challenges with a better sense of the history, especially local history? So when I did this, this, this topic, and by the way, the, uh, the rum and the beef jerky, that is a future topic. That's kind of a little more. I'll, I'll tell you about that next time. Today I'm going to be talking about my current uh, research project. It's a manuscript in progress, which looks at California. It kind of asks us to reimagine California. What did trade and commodities in native California look like before the... This, this, uh, this period, the mission period. For many of us, this is when California history starts. For those of you in my classes, we know that this isn't when California history starts. California history, of course, traditionally started on the coast. So in my, in my research topic in, the, in, the, in today's talk, I'm looking at the interior. When we think of the interior, I call it the, the interior world. We, again, we think a lot of times when you think of California, you think of the, the economic power of the coast. But really, most of the economic power, or at least as much economic power, comes from the interior, from the valleys, of course, from the production of, of food, but also from the Colorado River. None of us would be here without that, without the power, without the hydropower, without the water itself from the Colorado River. So I look at what I do is I look at the Colorado River and look at the native history of it and how and show how it was central to California history, what will become California, and central to the West and the interactions there. The other, the other this title also uh, talks to play on, uh, or asks you to think about the West. So when we think of the West, we usually think of frontier, the kind of moving West from, from the Atlantic, kind of uh, settlers, civilized, quote unquote, civilizing the landscape, changing the landscape, making it more uh, agricultural, making it more industrial, making it more urban. When you think of the West, that's traditionally how it's thought of. And what, I, what I'm going to ask you to do today is kind of rethink that, the concept of the West, especially when you think of it from the indigenous perspective, from Native America. So when you look at it from Native America, 
Obviously, it's not. You can't, you can't call it the West. And so what does that mean when we rethink that? So all these things kind of play a role, and of course commodities, which we're going to talk about today, in the way we think about our lives, and the way we interact in California today. So, very, if you don't mind, if you allow me to indulge, my, indulge, uh, myself, indulge you all and ask you a couple questions. What is this a map of? California. California. <laughs> What's, what, what do you see here on, these, uh, on this map? Uh, rivers and roads. Rivers and roads. Trading routes? Trading routes. <laughs> and in fact, you can kind of you can see the, the outline of many of these highways. I-5, and many of you who have gone to Vegas, you can kind of see the I-15, uh, 40. You can even see Southern California, of course, has a little, <coughs> more, it's a little more congested. Sorry, it's a little cut off. So these are two maps of, of California highways. The right, of course, you recognize as a typical road map of all the freeways. On the left, it's actually a map constructed by uh, the, the earliest anthropologists who went out in the field, who went to California communities and constructed this California history. And what they found was that this map on the left, which is actually a map of Indian country, a map of native trading routes, is strikingly similar to the roads, the highways that we rely on today. So much of that history, the way we interact, funny guys, there's a couple of chairs over here. The way we interact today, the way we trade, the way we, we uh, go to Vegas, the way we purchase things, we rely on those same trading routes that were constructed over 500 years ago. And in fact, those routes in California were connected to a larger transcontinental um, trading network. So you can see, again, it's cut off, but there are, there are goods, much, much of this is constructed by archaeologists, anthropologists. You can see goods as far north as Alaska, making it all the way down to Mexico, and vice versa. Goods being transported from east to west and coast to coast. So all of these things goods, which of course goods are attached to cultural values and economic value, were traded back and forth for, for uh, these, this, this trading network is, uh, it's an ancient trade network routes, but this is around a thousand, <coughs> about a thousand years ago. So these trading networks also change depending on where the, the locus of economic power was. So it's important to remember these are dynamic. But these things also, of course, were connected to Latin America, what we now call Latin America. This is a really cool map. That, uh, so this is a map of human, of what are called humanized landscapes. This is actually in 1491, right before the so-called Columbian Exchange. And what you see here is it's a little bit blurry, but basically different types of human interaction with the environment. So some of the lines, um, without getting into too much detail, you can see around Mesoamerica, what's called Mesoamerica, you see heavy agricultural uh, use. In the middle of, of the Mississippi River uh, Delta, you see a lot of, of course, a lot of irrigation systems that, that, that kind of cross pattern there. All the way on the left, which is uh, Right over here, this is California. You see heavy, what is called anthropogenic, anthropogenetic, no, anthro, pro, anthropogenetic. I'm saying it wrong. Uh, fire, <laughs> fire use. Humans burning the landscape to to create more food as a, as a strategy. And what's interesting about that is when the anthrop anthropologists came here, and the way historians have seen California was, it was primordial. It was Eden. It was untouched. You had little, what we call tribelets, little remote communities that kind of lived off the land because California after all was so bountiful. And what this, this image shows is that rather than bountiful, it was managed. It was, a, it was a humanized landscape. There were orchards, acorn orchards. Of course, 
many of you who went through a California schools know about, in fourth grade you learned about A chords and making the mush <laughs> missions, right, right. But that was, it wasn't just the acorns were just there. They created, these different California uh, communities created these landscapes. Same, the same thing goes for native plants. When we think of native plants today, and it, there's a little bit throughout the, uh, these talks, there was some talk of about native landscapes and in terms of water restoration, in terms of landscape restoration, in terms of preserving um, the soil. Native plants were also managed. It wasn't just that there were sage bushes here and that's, they just showed up and people came and said, hey, here we go, let's use it. <laughs> they created these landscapes. They, they, they created these relationships with, with these plants. So, again, I'm sorry about this a little bit because it's cut off, but what this map shows is that North America, which usually is seen as kind of the, the nomadic place, the few planters, was just as irrigated except for certain parts of the plant in the southwest, but just as touched by, by the humans. <clears throat> this is just a, another this is a map to show during this time period, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is this early modern period. And the early modern period for historians usually occurred is a period roughly between, hopefully not because there aren't any colonialists here, but between the 15th century to the 18th century, more or less. Basically, this time from when Columbus discovered America to the, or encountered America to the Industrial Revolution. It's this time period when it was, things weren't modern, but things weren't, were kind of becoming modern. And when you see this, this uh, map, this is of Afro-Eurasia, Africa, Europe, and Asia, are these trading networks. The circles all represent a long distance uh, trading networks, extensive trading networks. And what I just wanted to show here is during the same time period, I'll show you the other map of of the Americas and, and the humanized landscape and the, and the trading routes. Well, the same thing, of course, is going on in, in Afro-Eurasia that was going on in, in the Americas. Of course, the, the volume might have been different, but the, the economic systems, there were a lot of parallels. And of course, if you notice, the center of this world is not Europe, which is all on the edge. We all know that. The Indian Ocean world and, and, and uh, Asia was really the heart, heart of these trading networks. So. So now we know there's, there's common trading networks. This is uh, Botticelli, uh, the birth of Venus, 15th century, and as many of my students probably recognize this, this painting, so I don't give away the, some of the punchlines. But this, this painting, of course, right in the middle of the painting, Venus is emerging out of a shell. And in, in early modern Europe, shells were considered um, virtuous, pure, true. And Venus, of course, represent, represented all those characteristics. Now you have to remember, of course, in early modern Europe, most people didn't read. And symbols and painting and art were profoundly important, just as they are today. For those of you who don't think symbols are that important today. <laughs> Everyone knows this is shell gas, right? Shell gas, of course, adopted that, the shell to, rep, to kind of convey those images. You could trust us. You could do business with us. Where we have integrity. The shell, so that, that symbol of the shell, of course, carried with it all these meanings that everyone understood. And, you could, and it, of course, you can see that not just in Europe, you can see it in parts of Asia and Africa as well. <clears throat> well, in Native America, of course, shells, which we're going to talk, talk about in a minute in more detail, were profoundly important as well. Shells also represented truth, integrity, uh, something you could trust, rely on. Like a like a like gold, in some in some instances. This is an image of uh, Iroquois chiefs in the 19th century, a bunch of leaders, who are all holding wampum beads, wampum belts rather. Wampum belts were made of, of basically wampum was a type of shell, and they uh, leaders would, to commemorate political dialogue, to, to commemorate a, a deal made between, usually between between the British or French, and Indian groups, they would create these belts that of course, convey that this deal was good. We could trust each other. And I'm going to give you this belt because, and the shells represent this idea of integrity, that you're, gonna, you're not going to turn your back on us. You're not going to go back on your word. So these wampum and shell and uh, <coughs> wampum belts were, were profoundly important. And you can see the similar symbols that were conveyed and that were understood by all types of people. You know about that? 
So I just wanted to show you some shell beads, of course. So you have these shells, and then you have, uh, these are beads from all over the world. This, on the top, you have beads from, uh, from West Africa that were traded. At the bottom there are uh, stone glass, or glass beads from, from, uh, from the, I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> on the left, those are the Eyes of God beads from, from Java, from Indonesia. And on the right, those are uh, called Islamic beads from, uh, from, the, from the Near East. On the left, Venice, Venetian beads, glass beads. Very important during this time, during the early, early modern period. And then turquoise beads, which are from the southwest, but also are traded in Africa and all parts of the world. So, shells. In California, shell beads were not only kind of a preciosity, they weren't well, not only worn, but they were used as currency. And this, map, this image here shows the guys, hold, there's a guy's hand on the left, or a gal. They're holding a, uh, a stone bowl, and you can see the, the olivella shell in the, in the kind of the left corner. And those little tiny beads are, that's what those are the shell beads that were constructed out of the olive uh, shell. So you can see how fine, how detailed, how, these are, these are shell beads from pre, the pre-contact era. So before, before during, at least from the 15th century, if not before. So you see how, how much craft and how much detail went into it, and how much uniformity to make it into a currency. And what, what would happen was uh, shell beads were produced on the Channel Islands, just off the shore here. And uh, the olivella shell, this species of, of, uh, of uh, mollusk, mollusk, correct? Hope I'm, hope I'm correct there. They were, they, were, they were found in great numbers off the, the Channel Islands. And basically, it was manu they were manufactured there. It was kind of an industrial operation where you had labor, you had a labor system, you had people living there, you had people controlling the manufacturing of these shell beads produced in the millions, and then shipped off the island and traded throughout California and the southwest into Mexico as far north. Some, they found these shell beads as far north as Vancouver, as far east as Texas. So they abroad over a thousand miles in, in every way. Just to give you a sense of, of how detailed, how long it would take to manufacture this. So in the top left corner, which is a little bit cut off, you have a little bit of the shell, kind of in its rough form. And in the bottom right corner, you can see it's about three, two, three centimeters. That's the finished product. It would take roughly two hours for, to, to make one of those. And archaeologists have kind of done it. They used to they use a sea lion whiskers as kind of the drill. That's what they used. And it would take about roughly two hours to make that. So imagine two hours for one behind is a million. Or, you know, the, the exact number isn't there, but you get the sense of it as a commodity, as a currency. Can I ask a question? Yes. Who was doing that labor? Men and women. Men and women. Men and women. Okay. Yeah, great question. We'll get to that, definitely. So, so yeah, so there's manufacturing shape gender relations. Men controlled, there were, there were basically, it was like a trade union in many ways. Men controlled... Because you had to get it shipped across, you made it on the island, so how are you going to get it across? So they, they, they made these canoes that could hold up to a ton. They were called the, in Chumash, the Tomals. And people controlled the, the manufacturing of the canoes. Who was going to be able, like it was like a trade guild. Who was going to, man, who was going to create the canoes? Who was going to be able to go back and forth? And it became like a mint in many ways. It was a, it was a spot where you could control the production of this, of this wealth. This is a, an, an image, you're not going to be able to read all the names, but this is of the coast. We are, we are, are kind of all the way over, all the way over here. This is San Fernando Mission. So here's the coast, Point Doom. And uh, this is actually a map, it looks like Southern California, very, a lot of, lot of towns. But these are actually, town, these are Chumash towns. This is what the Chumash world looked like in the, in the 15th and 16th century. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say this looks like a pretty populated area. And many of the towns that we live in today, of course, including including Whittier and, and the area, which was once a rancho, which was once part of a mission, was a Tongva village. So you have native native towns, native small cities. Some of these were had more at least well, small towns, so not more than a few hundred people, but relatively large. And they, they populated Southern California, and then you can see on the bottom 
those are the Channel Islands where you have the, the manufacturing of the shell beads. So you have this economic system that is kind of flourishing in, in California. Very different than that idea of the hunter-gatherer, tribalists that are, have these isolated communities who are just kind of eating acorns and making their mush and picking sage and, you know, having a good time. <laughs> Much more complicated. Where was the rum? Rum is, a, rum is in the after hour. After the, uh, that's, the next, that's the next talk. You missed my talk, I'm sure. <laughs> so, what, the question is, what are they... You make all these shell beads. What are you going to do with them? What are you going to get for them? What's the market? And there was a market. And the market stitched primarily the Southwest communities, present-day New Mexico, Arizona, the Pueblo world, with, with the coast. So it was an east, it's primarily an east-west trading network. It did go north and south, but really the majority of the goods went east and west. One of the major goods were baskets. And baskets plays into the steam of sustainability in, in many ways, because baskets were, these weren't just any baskets, these were, baskets were incredible. In fact, the weaving tradition, which women controlled, they controlled this market, they controlled the production, and they still do today. California basket weavers, are primarily women, and is a, is a huge cultural economic uh, system around that. Baskets were, they, they only came from certain types of grasses. You need to have a specific species of grass to hold the basket together. These baskets were so tight that you could fill it up with water so it wouldn't leak. So they had to be durable. They had to be quality goods. And of course, the ornamental. This, these are baskets uh, taken a picture of in the 19th, late 19th century. Um, these are actually some basket weavers. You can get a sense of there's all the strands of grass kind of going up and how complex this making a basket was. On the left, on the left you have a woman named Eliza uh, Kuhn, who was a Pomo uh, woman, which is uh, north of San Francisco. That's, they live north of San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco. On the right, uh, you have a woman named uh, Jessie Durant. She is uh, Yosemite, and she's one of the most famous uh, basket makers. And you can see she's kind of a I'm not sure what she's picking up, but the idea is that it could keep the water in. So baskets were profoundly important. You carried goods on it. You could, uh, you know, you could all do all kinds of things with multi-use. multi, multi -use. And baskets were made not just in California, but throughout the Great Basin. Utah, Nevada, parts of Arizona. So they were something that was, it was something that was traded back and forth. By the way, let me know how we are on, on, on time. Okay, great. Great. <clears throat> so the other question, so baskets were traded for the shell beads. The other thing was uh, cotton. <coughs> when we think of cotton, of course, many of us think of King Cotton in the South. That's where, you know, that's where cotton was grown, of course, grown by slaves. There's a huge cotton economy. There still is a cotton economy uh, that is uh, part of the U.S. economy. But cotton was grown by the, the Akimel Odoms, which are also known as the, the Pimas. Cotton was grown all along the Gila River in present-day Arizona, parts of New Mexico. And it was made, it was uh, woven into to, uh, textiles, to kind of blankets. Of course, blankets traveled very well, just like baskets. You could bring them long distances because they didn't have uh, draft animals. They had to do everything on their back. So it was something that was, a, it was a, a commodity. It was a good that you could move back and forth that was very useful. And cotton you couldn't grow uh, in California. It was you, you grew it on, along irrigated uh, rivers in Arizona. These are actually some uh, Hopi weavers. You can get a sense of the process. Again, cotton weaving, just like basket making, it's actually a little more com uh, complicated. Weaving uh, relied on kind of artistic, uh, artistic prowess as much as uh, just skill in, in picking cotton and, and weaving. So men and women were prominent uh, weavers. And basically, you, you built a reputation. Certain towns had a reputation for certain styles of weaving. And those are the towns you try to get. You pay the shell beads and try to get that, the, try to get those textiles from certain pueblos or certain groups of people. So you see a market, kind of supply and demand, production and consumption. And then, of course, many of you are probably familiar with Pueblo pottery. Many, many Pueblo sh uh, pottery shards from, uh, from Arizona and New Mexico have been found in, in Los Angeles. So that came this way as well. <coughs> so, this just gives you a sense of the complexity, the cultural complexity of the region. So right in the middle, as I mentioned, that's basically the, the, 
the crux of my research looks at this, this region, the Colorado River, which goes right through the middle of this, this screen here. On the left, you have the Pacific Ocean, and then you have Baja and Sonora on the bottom, and Arizona to the right. So you see all these different native groups. And of course, many, they're all kind of centered around the Colorado River. And the, this, there were two, they're called tribal alliances, but really kind of two economic, political economic rivalries. You had what was called the, uh, the Kutchin, which they're right at the lower Colorado River, right in, the, towards, right in the middle of the screen, actually. They were the most, one of the most powerful Indian groups, and they, would call, they kind of ran this alliance called the Kutchin Alliance. And then you had the Maricopa Alliance, just to the east of the Kutchin, who were kind of their rivals, economic, political rivals. And over, since at least, uh, it's been documented since at least the late 15th century, these two alliances kind of forged and fought against each other. Usually it was kind of raiding, kind of uh, not, not all out war, but kind of you go to a village, you raid, you get raided back and forth. And usually it was, there was an economic implication, but also a kind of a cultural dimension to this warfare. So they fought, and they fought not over the coast. You know, everyone wants to live on the coast. Well, everyone wanted to live in the Colorado River. Everyone wanted action in the Colorado River back, back in the uh, 15th and 16th century. So you get a sense of that it was anything but isolated communities that didn't interact with each other. The other interesting, one of the most interesting parts of my research, I think, um, is that these trading routes, many, many people look at those trading routes and say, well, hey, of course that we're going to build on those roads. Those roads went through the mountain passes. Those are the natural, that was a natural way. There was a pass through this mountain, of course you're going to go that way. They didn't, bla they didn't blaze the trail. They just kind of helped widen it a little bit. They didn't actually create it. They kind of just went along with the natural rhythm of the landscape. Well, what I argue in my project is that, in fact, many of those trails go through the Mojave Desert. And if any of you have been to the Mojave Desert, it's not really a place that you want to follow the natural <laughs> landscape. <laughs> it's a place you avoid at all costs. Although it's a beautiful place, we go there as you know to get a sense of that, you know, beautiful desolation, beautiful isolation. The Mojave is the Mojave Desert, and the Death Valley is one of the it's one of the driest places. One of the, the, the hottest, most inhospitable places in the world. Yet, it has one of the highest incidences or highest uh, amounts of, of uh, petroglyphs, of rock art. This is an example of one of, it, one of them. So, rock art. So, why would the most desolate, one of the most desolate places, a very inhospitable place, have all these instances of art? Well, because people traded went through these. It was the most, it was the most uh, efficient way to get from point A to point B through these trading networks. And what you did was, this, this, kind of, this actually rock has been called newspaper rock. And you can see here, not only does it have kind of <coughs> symbols, sacred symbols that many, you know, many, unless you're a native, or unless you're from a certain native group, can you understand. But you also see horses. You also see kind of the impact of European uh, interaction. The horses didn't come into the region until the 17th century. But what this also demonstrates is people travel back and forth and they wanted to know where water was. They wanted to know where the antelopes were. They wanted to know where they can get some food. And then use this kind of like the billboard. You know, you're on the you're on the I-40, you see the, the great you know, in and out. All right, let's get off and in and out and have we're ready to eat, you know. For those of you knowing, they know you know I love to eat, so that's uh that's how I was thinking of this. But this idea of it's a billboard for all kinds of people to use to kind of get get on their way. It was a, it was a way to, to make trade more efficient. And at the same time, for those of you who know about the, the Silk Road, which is a, a great a great parallel, the Silk Road has these really isolated places that connect these incredible economic systems. And when you go to these places, you see the mix of incredible... Uh, artistic, religious, spiritual traditions, all in one. You see Buddhists next to, uh, you know, an image of Mary or Jesus. You see all these, you see these Hindu, symbol, Hindu symbols next to uh, Christian symbols. You see the same kind, we don't know, understand a lot of these, especially non-natives, but you see the same type of interaction. So if the Silk Road, which we know is a huge connector, economic connector, 
demonstrated these same kinds of uh, illustrations. Why could Native California have the same type of economic system in some, one way or another? So, I'm, I'm finishing up here, but now I wanted to show you this map again and just remind you next time we're on, the, on these roads, which we're going to be on every day, um, just think about when we think about sustainability and we're thinking about how we as Californians are going to reimagine ourselves. Just remember that there was this history that is being reimagined, that's being, or it's being retold, and that it plays an integral part in the way forward in the future. So, thank you very much.